Okay, the Pirates, Chapter 1. The bridge of the Quadag mercenary was engulfed in a cloud of thick black choking smoke. Scarlet red and luminous orange flames stanced and glistened against the gleaming metallic walls of the ship. Smouldering bodies lay slumped over their consoles, and the smell of burning flesh hung in the air like the welcoming scent of roast pork on your, in your mother's kitchen on a Sunday afternoon. Captain Riley gasped for breath. He coughed and vomited, his lungs burning. Engage air purification protocols, he ordered. Air ducts activated, replied the gruff voice of Chief Engineer Morgan over the intercommunications speaker. Walter Riley stood up and rubbed his stinging eyes with the palms of his hands. A few seconds later, the smoke began to clear, such down through the vents and the floor of the bridge. Why the hell haven't the sprinklers activated, he yelled the grey-haired man in the captain's chair. Riley to engineering, I need a fire control board on the bridge immediately. Captain Riley turned his head towards the burning body of Ensign Torcus. And send up an emergency medical team. We've got wounded up here. Bad news, Captain, replied a sharp metallic voice. What? shouted Captain Riley. The sick bay was hit by that last blast. There were no survivors. All the fire control droids are down there now, explained Exquamillion, the Quadag mercenary's cyborg pilot. Forget about the sick bay. I need them on the bridge, commanded the captain. Captain Walter Riley sat down and unzipped his jacket. He pressed a green button on the left arm of the captain's chair. This is the captain speaking. <coughs> if any of you can still walk, then report to the bridge. This battle isn't over yet. He looked around him at the smouldering bodies of his bridge crew. Any of you people still alive, he asked. There was no reply. Captain Riley coughed up a ball of yellow phlegm and spat it onto the metallic floor. There was a loud clanking sound, like an iron hammer against a sheet of cold steel. A pair of bony blue hands pulled open the sliding doors of the elevator, and Commander Bonnet clambered onto the bridge. His green uniform was scorched and torn and splattered in yellow blood. Sir, Dr. White is dead, the blue man, the blue man announced. So I heard, replied Captain Riley. <coughs> Are any of the medic droids still functioning? The blue-skinned man shook his head. MDs 3, 4 and 5 were all destroyed in that last attack. Medic droids 1 and 2 are both damaged, but Morgan should be able to repair them. We've lost a lot of good people, sir, and I don't think the ship can take much more. We've suffered heavy casualties on all decks. <coughs> I'll cry about it tomorrow, Commander, sighed the captain. <coughs> a red fire control droid followed the blue man onto the bridge. It was a small machine about two metres in height, rolling around the room on tank tracks. A plume of fluorescent green smoke sprayed from a swirling hose on the top of the robot, and the fires were soon extinguished. William Bonnet pulled the smouldering corpse of Lieutenant Criola away from her blackened workstation. He pressed a yellow button on the communications console, and the image of a Ventari warship appeared on the view screen. The Ventari are a particularly violent race. The Ventari females are well known to eat their first-born male offspring. They consider men to be the weaker sex, and as such a daughter receives the higher status in their society. It is the Ventari women who are the warriors, and the men who are their servants. <coughs> the Association is a group of ruling planets who control our sector of the cosmos. They include Arcturus Prime, Venus, Torka, Mormosa, Earth and its colonies, and the Tyran Republic, to name but a few. The Association considers itself as the universal peacekeeping force and protector of the galaxy, and has been at war with the Aventari for 57 years. The Aventari refused to join the Association on the grounds that the President of the Universal Council was a male. President Rodenberry of the planet Earth declined the offer of a sex change operation, resulting in Queen Bodhika declaring her world as an independent planet. Ventari was attacked by the Association one week later.
The Wintai warship was closing in for the kill. It was a large, bottle-shaped silver vessel, at least ten times the size of the Quadrac Mercenary. Walter O'Reilly, sorry, the silver blue vessel, at least ten times the size of the Quadrac Mercenary. Walter O'Reilly leant back in his chair. Captain to engineering, what is your status, please? Hyperdrive engines are damaged, Captain, replied a gruff voice over the intercommunications speaker. We have, do we have any power left? asked the grey-haired man. The ele electroconducer is offline and the thermoreaction chamber is leaking. Repairs are going to take at least 12 hours, explained Chief Engineer Morgan. <laughs> I don't think we've got 12 minutes, let alone 12 hours, mister, replied the captain. I'm doing my, I'm doing my best, sir, Morgan insisted. How are the shields holding up? asked Commander Bonnie. Plate shielding is damaged, sir, operating at 57% efficiency. Captain to Armory, how are you doing down there? Low here, Captain, came the reply. We just fired our last primorphic torpedo, and the forward laser cannons are out of action. The graviton beam is inactive, and we are out of cluster mines. Captain Riley gazed at the view screen. The Ventari warship was getting closer, too close for the captain's comfort. Transfer all available power to the plate shielding, he ordered. Commander Bonnet looked up from the blackened communications console. Captain, I have a suggestion. What is it? asked the grey-haired man in the captain's chair. There was a loud clanking sound, like someone falling down a flight of metal stairs in a suit of armour. The metal plating of the shield engulfed the ship like a cocoon or an iron gauntlet. Commander Bonnet sat down at the command console. We transfer the power from the plate shielding and life support to the thermoreaction chamber, we should be able to reach light speed for at least 15 seconds. Enough time for us to get away. Captain Riley raised his eyebrows. This is the captain. All hands brace for impact, he commanded. Commander Bonnet turned towards the captain. I don't think this is a good idea, sir. Captain to pilot, exquamillion, prepare for ramming speed. That is an order. Aim for the horse belly. William Bonnet flicked a switch on the command console. Blay that order, pilot, he commanded. Walter Riley rose to his feet. I'm the captain of this vessel, sir. You are out of line. Captain Riley to pilot, I said ramming speed, now! The blue man drew his vat gun and aimed it in the direction of the captain. Sit down, sir, and shut the fuck up! Captain Riley sat down. Attention all hands, this is Commander Bonnet. Prepare for light speed. This is mutiny, mister, shouted the captain, rising to his feet. William Bonnet aimed his vat gun between Captain Riley's eyes. I said, sit down, sir. The grey-haired man sat down. Bonnet to engineering, transfer all available power to the thermoreaction chamber. Aye, sir, replied the gruff voice of the chief engineer. Bonnet to pilot, as soon as you have sufficient power, engage light speed drive. Yes, sir, replied the sharp metallic voice of Exquamillion. Captain Riley tried to stand up and Bonnet pushed him back into his seat with the barrel of his vat gun. If you stand up once more, I'll vaporise you, he warned. Pilot, yelled the captain. Ram that fucking ship now! Sorry, sir, replied the sharp metallic voice of its Grumillion. I'm a war veteran, not a kamikaze pilot. You are a coward, argued Captain Riley. I'd rather run away and live to fight another day than commit suicide, sir, replied the cyborg. Engaging light speed drive. The Quadrant Mercenary was sur surrounded by a bright white light and a dazzling display of kaleidoscopic swirling rainbows danced across the view screen, view screen spiralling in circles. After several minutes, the patterns flickered and faded to reveal an ocean of cold black space, silver stars glimmering in the emptiness. Security to the bridge, ordered William Bonnet. I've relieved Captain Riley of his duties and I'm taking command of this vessel. Any crewman who wished to stay with the captain should report to Shuttle Bay 2. Captain Riley laughed. You won't get away with this, Billy. The blue-skinned man folded his arms across his chest. We'll see, Walt. We'll see. The association will not rest until every single one of you is caught and executed. Commander Bonnet shrugged his shoulders. If you were still in command, we would all be dead already. Now, if you don't mind his standing up, you are sitting in my chair. Captain Riley stood up and stepped to one side. 
William Bonnet sat down on the captain's chair. Hmm. It's very comfortably smiled. Captain's pilot. What are your orders, sir? asked the sharp metallic voice of Esquimillion. Set course to Felicia. Morgan has a lot of repairs to make. Yes, Captain, replied the pilot. Captain Riley and his three loyal crew members were given a short-range shuttle and enough food and fuel for a five-day voyage. The course of the vessel was preset to the nearest planet with a breathable atmosphere, Epsilon. A distress beacon will be activated automatically when the shuttle lands, explained the blue-skinned man. The association should pick you up within a week or two, <laughs> if you survive that long. You should kill us now, suggested Captain Riley, while you still have the chance. Don't tempt me, sighed Bonnie, drawing his vap gun from its holster. He handed the gun to Captain Riley. He might need this. A hither Epsilon is a rather inhospitable world. Captain Riley took the vap gun and held it in his left hand. He pointed it at the blue man. Oh, don't even think about it, sighed the commander. I discharged the power cell. You can recharge the batteries from the shuttle's engines. I know how to charge a vap gun, Mr. Bonnie. Just watch out for the psi spiders, suggested the blue skinned man. I hear that they can suck out a man's brain in two minutes. This isn't the end, Billy. I'll be back, warned the grey haired man in the green uniform. The shuttle doors raised with a loud ka chunk. I will see you hang for this, Mr. Bonnet. That's a promise. Enjoy your holiday, Walter. William Bonnet saluted his ex commanding officer. And don't try touching the controls before you land. Any attempt to do so will cause the ship to self destruct. Captain Riley and his three crewmen boarded the shuttle and the doors lowered behind them with a slow, swishing sound. Excremillion, the cyborg pilot of the Quadag mercenary, had no choice but to stay with the ship. He was a veteran of the Amiga War and had been critically injured after his ship hit a plasma mine. He lost both his arms and legs in the blast and was awarded the Saturn Medal for Bravery. His body was grafted into the cockpit of the ship with cybernetic implants. Morgan, a small stout faced sorry, a small stout pig faced Hegean, also decided to stay with the vessel. He had been the chief engineer of the Quadag mercenary before the ship had even been built, and was responsible for the design of her engines. He regarded the Quadag as his baby. Cheng Lo was a young, slim, oriental gentleman, and had known William Bonnet for ten years. They had studied together at the University University on Uranus, and joined the Associated Space Corps in the same year, although they had been rivals rather than close friends. Gunnar Lowe was considered to be one of the best shots in the university and had won the association Markman Championships two years in a row before being beaten in the final year by Bonnet. They had served together on the Quadag Mercenary for five years under the command of Captain Riley. The Quadag Mercenary is an association Kogel class warship. The bow at the front of the vessel has five levels and is shaped like a dome. It houses the forward gun turret on the top deck, the armoury on the second deck and the bridges on the third. The pilot's cockpit is on the fourth deck of the ship and the engine room is on deck five. The body of the ship is shaped like an arrow pointing away from the bow with two thrusters on either side of the stern forming the letter M. The midship of the Quadag mercenary has three levels, housing the crew quarters, thick bay and galley. The shuttle bay is at the stern of the vessel. Below that is the cargo hold, and on the lowest level is the brig. Kind of looks a bit like that. Looks a little bit like that. Oh, see, there we go. Ah. Captain Bonnet to pilot, how long until we reach Felicia? asked the blue skinned man. Two days and impulse power, replied a sharp metallic voice over the intercommunication speaker. I'll be in the captain's cabin if you need me. Yes, sir, replied the cyborg. The door of the captain's cabin slid open with a swishing sound. Gunner Lowe followed the blue-skinned man. 
into the room. So this is where the boss used to sleep. It's a bit more spacious than the crew quarters, sighed the young slim oriental. William Bonnet picked up an oil painting from the purple carpeted floor and dusted it down with the sleeves of his jacket. Any damage asked low. Hmm. Not much, sighed the blue skinned man hanging the picture back in the wall back on the wall. The captain's cabin was richly decorated in olive green and scarlet red. A single bed with gold satin bedsheets was positioned in the centre of the room, and an ornately carved wooden desk lay on its side beside the bed. William Bonnet picked up the desk and put it back in its place. Gold-framed portraits of famous naval and starship captains hung side by side on the olive green walls. William Bonnet gazed at the portrait of Captain Riley. <laughs> it's not a very good likeness, is it? he asked, rubbing the back of his neck with his right hand. Cheng Lo laughed. I think it's called artistic licence. The blue-skinned man took down the painting and handed it to the gunner. Put this in the cargo hold with the others. We're going to have to sell them to pay for our repairs. It's going to cost a lot more than a few paintings, Billy, replied Lo. Strip down the whole ship if you have to. Anything that isn't bolted to the floor can go. We can start with the captain's desk. That should be worth something, suggested Bonnie. Gunner Lo sat down on the bed. and loosened his belt. The blue man scratched his chin. So, how would you like to be my first officer? The young Oriental shook his head. Thanks for the offer, Captain, but quite frankly I can do without with the responsibility. Weapons are my speciality. Fair enough, replied the blue-skinned man. I would be hard pushed to find another gunner with your expertise anyway. Captain Bonnet sat, sat down beside the Oriental. That was quite a battle, wasn't it? Cheng Lo smiled. I didn't think we'd get out of that one alive. The blue man stared at the growing bulge beneath his gunner's green trousers. You've got a hard on. The Oriental laughed. So have you. William Bonnet unzipped his dusty green jacket. Uh, we won't reach Felicia until tomorrow. Cheng Lo rubbed his groin with his right hand. Oh, do you want to wank? Asked the blue skinned man, throwing his jacket onto the floor. Gunner Lowe leant back on the bed, and William Bonnet unzipped the fly of the yellow man's trousers. I always feel horny after a fight, laughed Lowe. The blue man fumbled inside the Oriental's black underpants and pulled out his long, slim penis. That feels good, sighed Cheng. William Bonnet gripped Lowe's stiff yellow rod with his right hand and wanked her up and down. Cheng Lowe sat up on the bed and pulled Bonnie's green trousers down to his ankles. Huh. I've never sucked a blue cock before. He laughed. He put his arms around the captain's waist, clenching the blue man's buttocks with his fingers. He pulled him closer, nibbling at the bulge beneath William Bonnet's white silk briefs. I've been wanting to do this for years, he whispered. Cheng Lo gazed up at his captain. I used to watch you in the, shadow, in the showers at the academy. So did most of the other cadets. I was the only blue boy there. The yellow-skinned oriental licked the tip of the blue-skinned man's circumcised cock and let it slip into his warm, wet mouth. He sucked hard on the blue man's penis. Bonnet ran his fingers through Lowe's soft, silky black hair. I'm going to come, sighed the blue man, gazing down at his gunner. Cheng Lo gulped and swallowed the moon boy's spunk. Creamy white jism dripped from the corners of the yellow man's mouth. The blue-skinned man smiled. I think I'm going to enjoy being a pirate. End of chapter one.